Welcome back to the podcast, Unbinding the Bible. This week's episode is another by-the-book conversation, this time on the book Bad Faith, Race, and the Rise of the Religious Right. And the conversation that you are about to hear is one that I had with Randall Balmer, who is the author of Bad Faith, discussing what, to modern ears anyways, is a highly debated and highly heated topic, and that is looking at the issue of race um, in this country, as well as when talking about political perspectives, particularly those from the religious right, as Balmer's subtitle points out, is oftentimes the issue of abortion, which is another hotly debated topic in our day today. And one of the blessings of doing a podcast like the one I'm doing, and one of the purposes of doing this type of podcast, is the way I've chosen to approach Scripture over the years. You hear me say a lot about things that I was taught growing up that were just assumed norms. Um, Always read the Bible literally. Um, Don't take context or necessarily... um, culture into mind or genre that scripture is written in. And of course, we've had a lot of fun walking through Revelation dealing with just these same topics. But this reality extends to all manner of life in the church. And one of the big ones that it does is through this issue of abortion as it surrounds the Roe versus Wade decision of 1973. And in the history of the development of these topics, it's a little stickier than the way many modern people today talk about abortion as the reason why this moral majority or why these religious figures rallied a group of Christians around this issue to oppose this issue and to become a serious force of of a voting bloc in the United States. And Balmer is a professor of religion at Dartmouth College and is also an historian and has written several books. I'll give his bio to you in just a moment, but is raising the issue that there were some actually other court cases going on even before the Roe v. Wade court case and other issues that actually complicate that simplistic narrative. And one of the reasons why I'm bringing this book to your attention is because I hear this narrative a lot. I hear the narrative in churches of people who have become how they'll define themselves as single issue voters. And these are voters that tend to vote Republican because of the issue of abortion and because of the serious stance they believe the Republican politicians take toward this one issue and allow the belief and the narrative that this one issue is the reason why Republicans really got on board or uh, rather religious people got on board with the Republican Party 40 some years ago was precisely for this reason. And Balmer challenges this narrative and he does this with history and he lays out some perspectives that I think help make a whole lot more sense about the sticky topics that we're still debating about today as it pertains to religious freedom, as it pertains to conversations surrounding race, as it deals with issues about the police and law and order and states' rights and things that that has meant historically and what it still may in fact mean today. And one of the reasons why I wanted Balmer to talk with us about his book, um, aside from the fact that it's an excellent book, it's short, it's an easy read, very well researched is because he comes directly out of this evangelical subculture, as you'll hear him talk about on the, on the episode. He knows this world. He understands the way people inside this world think. And for the church's benefit, we want to be people of the truth. We believe we hold to the teachings of Jesus who claimed himself to be the truth. And yet it's surprising how often we spin narratives to convince ourselves of things that we believe are true when in fact they're not true. And so I don't bring this episode to any of your attentions to discourage you or to threaten. Um, Sadly, I feel like I need to qualify what you're about to hear by reminding you that just because you're going to hear a perspective of someone who pushes against 
the the right or the conservative uh, political bent does not mean that you can just write off the conversation and toss someone into the category of, oh, he must be coming from the left. This is a thing that the culture as a whole might be tempted to do. And that is if you hear a critique of your side, then you automatically assume that that critique is in defense of the other side. But as Christians, as followers of Jesus, as followers of the way, the truth, and the life, we don't play those kinds of games. Jesus was very free and needed to be free to critique his disciples without deciding that his disciples were the world's worst people. Like Jesus comes after us and rebukes us when we need it and critiques us when we need it so that we can come face to face with the reality Not not the imagined version that we tell ourselves or the narratives that we tell ourselves, but the true reality of the situation and the true reality of our own lives, we need to come face to face with it so that we can repent and find renewal and find freedom and find hope in following Jesus the right way. And what I believe we are facing today is a desperate need for the church to listen to actual history, is to listen to reality is to set our guard down long enough to hear the truth about what this narrative of what Balmer calls the abortion myth, what this narrative has actually done, not to put us on a positive trajectory for the kingdom of God today, but rather it has buried some truths, some ugly truths about some of the real reasons why moral majority people were formed and why the religious right was originally formed And it was not because of abortion. It was something quite a bit more sinister, which Bulmer will lay out for you in tremendous detail. And I'm very excited for you to be able to listen to this. And so I also want to let you know, I don't bring someone like Randall Bulmer onto this podcast to talk about abortion and to say that it's not abortion and you shouldn't care about that. You absolutely should care about this. And it might help you to know before you listen to this conversation that I personally am extremely pro-life. But I do find it helpful to make the distinction between being pro-life and just being pro-birth because I am pro-life. I want babies to be saved. I want mothers to get health care. I want the babies when they're born to receive care. I want people facing the death penalty to be able to be offered a chance at actual life. When I say I'm pro-life, I mean life from birth to the grave. I don't like it anymore that we grant certain people the rights to end someone's life after certain criminal activity has taken place. Then I prefer for anybody to end a fetus's life before that little baby has a chance to live in this world. And so I want us honestly to expand the definition. I I really don't like the narrative as it's typically debated in political partisan discussions today. And that is much more of a pro-birth stance. And Bulmer and I talk a little bit about that. And that is that fetuses don't tend to demand much. Um, While it is honorable and good and right to defend the cause of the unborn, it is not an issue that requires anything from those defending it. It's much stickier and it gets more into the heart of, I think, what it means to follow Jesus when we think about how difficult it actually is to care for babies once they're born, to step into the foster care system and see what we can do to help out children who are in positions with families where they're not being well taken care of, or mothers who've had their they're the father of their baby walk out on them and now they need somebody to help them sustain a life for this child that we strongly encouraged them to not abort and so the complication is the issue is very complicated and i don't mean to belittle it at all i am simply bringing this book forward because i think it is only healthy for the church to come face to face with the narratives we tell ourselves and compare those with things that are actually going on in the world. And the reason why I find a lot of hope in this is because this is precisely what the Old Testament does over and over and over again. 
Israel told themselves all sorts of narratives about how special they were in God's side and how exempt they were from the wrath of God and the judgment of God, despite how they chose to live. And the Lord had to continually send prophets who reminded the people of how far they had actually steered away from faithfulness to the covenant. And the people didn't like them. And so I'm well aware of the fact that presenting this material in the 21st century and using names of real politicians that many Christians actually love and revere is not going to make this a a respectful, necessarily a well-welcomed conversation. And that's okay. I tend to imagine if you don't like this type of conversation, you may or may not finish the episode and that is also fine. But what I think we need to be prepared to do as Christians is to face the truth about the things that we believe And history doesn't lie. History unfolds reality as it actually happened. And I think if we are willing to come face to face with that fact, it might reshape the way we think about our lives. It might reshape the way we talk about these things in the church. And I think strengthen the witness that we have and the stance and the posture that we take toward the world. And so I'm excited to share with you this conversation I have with Randall Balmer, He is an Episcopal priest, and he is the John Phillips Professor in Religion at Dartmouth College. Before coming to Dartmouth in 2012, he was a professor of American religious history at Columbia University for 27 years. He is the author of more than a dozen books, including the one we're talking about today, Bad Faith, Race, and the Rise of the Religious Right, as well as Redeemer, The Life of Jimmy Carter. His second book... Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory, A Journey into the Evangelical Subculture in America, now in its fifth edition, was made into an award-winning documentary for PBS. His commentaries on religion in American life appear in newspapers across the country, including the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, the Des Moines Register, the Santa Fe New Mexican, and the New York Daily News. We have about a 40-minute conversation I'm very excited for you to listen to it. And without any more of an introduction, I offer to you the conversation I have with Randall Balmer. So we have Randall Balmer with us um, on the episode today about his book, Bad Faith, Race, and the Rise of the Religious Right. And um, Randall, it's really great to have you on the show today. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Joshua. Yeah. Well, I um, heard about your book actually several weeks ago on the Holy Post podcast. Um, Sky Jatani interviewed you and I listened to that discussion and then picked up your book and thought, wow, this is one of the f- few books I've actually been able to tackle in just an afternoon and read the whole thing. <laughs> so I'm really grateful for that. And um, I just wondered if you might set up my own listeners for a little bit about yourself and what led to the writing of this book. Sure, I can do that. Uh, well, I grew up in what I call the evangelical subculture. Uh, my father was a minister for 40 years in the Evangelical Free Church of America. And um, I want to be clear that uh, I honor both his ministry and his memory. Uh, he passed away, uh, well, now about 20 years ago, uh, sadly. But uh, I grew up in this evangelical world or the evangelical subculture, as I call it. Uh, going to church several times a week, Sunday school, Sunday evening service, Wednesday night, uh, youth group over the weekend, and uh, vacation Bible school in the summer, Bible camp, uh, and went on to a Christian college, an evangelical school, and an evangelical seminary. So uh, I, I like to joke sometimes that uh, that I'll, I'll put my evangelical credentials up, about, uh, up against anyone, uh, including Franklin Graham. I think the big difference there is his father was probably more famous than my father. But nevertheless, uh, this is the world I grew up in and the world uh, to which I remain very attached in in the sense that this uh, tradition shaped me profoundly. And I'm grateful for that. And yet at the same time, I think that uh, over the last 40 years or so, uh, the tradition, I think, has gone astray with its uh, uh, involvement in politics and uh, affiliation with the far right uh, extremes of uh, American politics. So uh, I guess what prompted the book in, in particular, uh, there, there was a moment, and I'm happy to recount that here, 
in November of 1990, at that time I was teaching at uh, Columbia University before I moved on to Dartmouth in 2012. And I was invited to Washington, D.C. for what turned out to be a closed door meeting. About 30 people, all of them men, as I recall, gathered in a hotel conference room to talk about the religious right. And actually the gathering was meant to be a, an observation or a celebration, really, of the 10-year anniversary of the election of Ronald Reagan to the presidency in November of 1980. And uh, I felt a little bit out of place because, frankly, I hadn't celebrated <laughs> that election 10 years earlier. But here I was, and I thought, well, I'll make the most, most of this. And in the first session, uh, and I'm in a room here with a, a kind of who's who of the religious right. Richard Vigory, the uh, direct male guru for conservative causes. Donald Wildman, uh, the founder of the American Family Association, which uh, did all these boycotts against uh, network television back in the in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, Ed Dobson, who had been Jerry Falwell's lieutenant at Moral Majority. Uh, Carl F.H. Henry, the founding editor of Christianity Today magazine. Richard Land from the Southern Baptist Convention, um, Ralph Reed, executive director of the Christian Coalition, and Paul Weirich, who I knew at the time, was really the architect of the religious right. And in the first session, in the course of, of, of the um, conversation, the discussion, Paul Weirich made this impassioned statement. He said, let's remember that this movement, meaning the religious right, did not organize in opposition to abortion. We organized instead to defend the tax exemption of evangelical institutions, uh, particularly Bob Jones University, but also so-called whites-only segregation academies. And uh, he was just emphatic about this. And Ed Dobson, who again was, uh, Ed, uh, was uh, Jerry Falwell's right-hand man at Moral Majority, said, um, he, he concurred. He said, I, I, I'm paraphrasing slightly here, but his, his quotation was very close to something like this. I sat in the non-smoke-filled back rooms when the moral majority and the religious right was organizing. And I don't recall anybody talking about abortion. Well, the discussion continued and then there was a break before the next session and I went up to Wyrick and I said, I want to make sure I understood you correctly. Abortion had nothing to do with the mobilization of evangelical voters in the 1970s. He said, absolutely not. He said, I had been trying since the Goldwater campaign back in 1964 to get these people, meaning evangelicals, interested in politics. And he said, I tried everything. I tried the school prayer issue. I tried the pornography issue. I tried the women's rights issue. I tried abortion. Nothing got their attention until the IRS began coming after these tax exemptions in the 1970s. He said that was the genesis of the movement, it had nothing to do with abortion. So uh, I've gone on far too long here, but that is what got me started on this quest to find the real origins of the religious right. And I can say today, without fear of contradiction, <laughs> that those origins had nothing whatsoever to do with abortion, which, after all, evangelicals considered a Catholic issue in the 1970s. No, you absolutely have not gone on far too long. This is exactly why I wanted you to be on my podcast, because I wanted you to be able to um, walk us through some of this history and just to be able, like you said, you can stack your credentials up against the best of them. Um, and just that, that name of, of those acquaintances you've had and conversations that you've had. Um, I come from a very similar background where the language, especially as it relates to religion and politics from the Christian standpoint, um, is very much centered around abortion. And it's very much yes. centered around Roe v. Wade um, and, and other things. And so I, I, there, there actually was a significant court case in, in the past, um, probably not Roe v. Wade. Would you talk about another court case that may sure. have had a little bit more to do with this issue? Sure. And, you know, Joshua, if I may, let me just kind of um, uh, cite a bit of the evidence for what I call the abortion myth, that is to uh, refute the abortion myth. If, do you mind if I do that? To, just to please, kind of please do. Set the background. 
so, so as I said earlier in my, my first response, uh, evangelicals considered abortion a Catholic issue in the 1970s. And let me just give you a little bit of evidence for that. In 1968, Christianity Today, which is really the flagship magazine for evangelicalism, conducted a conference together with another evangelical group called the Christian Medical Society to discuss the morality of abortion. And this conference uh, drew, you know, kind of the heavyweight theologians from the evangelical world. They met over the course of several days. And at the end of their deliberations, they issued a statement saying, well, we really can't decide about the morality of abortion, but we think it should be available. 1971, the Southern Baptist Convention, which is not exactly known as a redoubt of liberalism, passed a resolution calling for the legalization of abortion. They reaffirmed that resolution in 1974, that's a year after Roe v. Wade, and again in 1976. When the ruling was handed down, W.A. Criswell, pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas, one of the most famous evangelicals of the 20th century, also a former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, issued a sta statement applauding the Roe v. Wade decision. Even James Dobson, issued a statement in 1973 after the Roe v. Wade decision saying that the fetus is not, should not be considered a human being in evangelical theology. And finally, again, I could go on and on, Joshua, but I don't want to, uh, I don't want to um, <laughs> monopolize this with this particular point. But uh, Jerry Falwell, by his own admission, did not preach his first anti-abortion sermon until February of 1978. That's more than five years after the Roe v. Wade decision. So you can understand why I call this the abortion myth. The abortion myth is the fiction that evangelicals galvanized as a political movement in direct response to the Roe v. Wade decision of 1973. Now I'm going to pick up on your, <laughs> on, on the real question you asked me here, uh, sure. because you hinted, it, hinted at it in your question. That is to say, yes, there is another co court decision that's important in this um, conversation, and it's not Roe v. Wade from the Supreme Court. It is a 1971 decision in a case called Green v. Connolly, and the venue for this decision was the District Court for the District of Columbia, not the Supreme Court. A bit of background for Green v. Connolly. Uh, the deep background, of course, was the Supreme Court's Brown decision of May 17, 1954, when the Supreme Court ordered the desegregation of public schools, quote, with all deliberate speed. It's a wonderful phrase coming out of the Supreme Court. Fast forward 10 years, Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964 on July 2nd, that forbade racial discrimination in public institutions. What happened at various places around the country, but in particular in Holmes County, Mississippi, in the first year of desegregation, the number of white students in the public school system in Holmes County, Mississippi, dropped from over 700 to 28. The second year of desegregation, the number of white students in the public schools dropped to zero. At the same time, three whites-only church-sponsored segregation academies applied to the Internal Revenue Service for tax-exempt status. And a group of parents in Holmes County, Mississippi said, wait a minute, this isn't right. So they filed suit to block the granting of tax exemption to these institutions. The case from Holmes County was combined with another case. You know, it has a long judicial history, but it finally ended up in the district court for the District of Columbia. And on June 30th, 1971, the court issued its decision, which said, in effect, that any organization that engages in racial segregation or racial discrimination is not, by definition, a charitable institution. And therefore, it has no claims on tax-exempt status. Now, Richard Nixon was president at the time. And in the wake of that decision, he instructed the Internal Revenue Service not to issue new tax exemptions for 
such schools that were racially discrimin discriminated, uh, discriminating, pardon me. But as the IRS over the course of 1970s began to enforce the Green v. Connolly decision, that is what got the attention of people like Jerry Falwell, who had his own segregation academy in Lynchburg, Virginia, and Bob Jones University and other evangelical leaders. This is what prompted their political activism in the 1970s, had nothing whatsoever to do with abortion or the Roe v. Wade decision of 1973. So if I understand you correctly, um, that if I remember in your book, several, like you had said, several issues had been put forward as the thing that, that different leaders thought might rally, rally the, the troops, if you will, the evangelical voters. Um, but that this one was, they, it was kind of framed a little bit different. Wasn't it almost framed as, as a government overreach or, you know, they're, they're trying to take away our freedoms or, or something of that, of that sort. That's the, that was the genius of Paul Weyrich. Absolutely. You're absolutely right, Joshua. Uh, Weyrich recognized, I mean, first of all, he, the IRS thing finally got the attention of people like Falwell and other evangelical leaders, but Weyrich was savvy enough to recognize that he needed a different issue in order to really mobilize grassroots evangelical voters. He, did, he needed an issue other than a defense of racial segregation. And what happens, and, and this, is, uh, this is really quite remarkable, actually, uh, when I began to discover the real history here, uh, what happened is in the midterm elections of 1978, obviously this is not a presidential election. Jimmy Carter had been elected in 1976, and then the midterm elections occurred uh, two years later. Weyrich went to the head of the Republican National Committee. At that time, it was uh, Bill Brock, former senator from Tennessee. And he went to, to, to Brock and said, I, I want some money to organize these uh, voters, these evangelical voters. And according to Weyrich, uh, Brock looked across the desk at him and said, who are you talking about? Who are these people? I'm not going to give you this money. And Weyrich got kind of angry about this, apparently. And he resolved, in his own words, to go out and elect some improbable people to the Senate in 1978. He focused on four Senate races. One of them was in New Hampshire, where Thomas McIntyre was running for re-election. And then uh, another was in Iowa, where Dick Clark, a Democratic senator, was running for re-election. And two Senate races in Minnesota. One of them was for the unexpired term of Walter Mondale, who, of course, was uh, Jimmy Carter's vice president. And in all four of those races, the Democratic nominees, according to polling data, as well as in uh, according to uh, poll to pundits, were headed for easy wins. In Iowa, for example, no poll going into the election showed Dick Clark leading by fewer than 10 percentage points. I mean, he was an easy re-election. But what happened is that on the final weekend of the campaign, pro-lifers, Roman Catholics, leafleted church parking lots. And two days later, in an election with a very low turnout, pro-lifers defeated the favored Democratic candidates. Now, I remember going through Paul Weyrich's papers um, when I was doing research out at the, the papers are out at the University of Wyoming in Laramie. And when I came across the papers surrounding this midterm election in 1978, it's almost like the, the papers begin to sizzle <laughs> because mm -hmm. Weyrich realizes he's finally got an issue that is going to work for him to mobilize grassroots evangelical voters. Abortion is going to work. And abortion for the religious right was really a godsend. And it, it was, you know, I, again, I'm, and I'm not trying to, to suggest that evangelical voters are not sincerely devoted to the anti-abortion cause. I, I, many, probably most, the overwhelming majority are. But let's also consider the fact that in many ways, the embrace of the anti-abortion cause was a fairly low cost 
issue for people like Weyrich, people like the religious right. Uh, the fetus doesn't demand much. The fetus doesn't demand health care or education or access to medical care. Uh, so this was a fairly um, easy, again, I'm, and I'm not trying to, to um, trivialize the issue because the issue I think is important. It, it is a, a moral issue. But the embrace of abortion, as I said, for the religious right really was a godsend because it allowed them to deflect the attention from the real issue that formed that movement. Uh, the other thing I'll say about this, and again, this is part of Weirich's genius, even on the tax exemption issue, again, let's, let's remember, this is tax exemption for racially segregated institutions. Weirich was also able to shift the conversation away from a defense of racial segregation to a so-called defense of religious freedom. And by the way, in doing so, he wrote a page from the contemporary <laughs> religious right playbook that you see in the Hobby Lobby case, for example, but also in the Colorado Cake Master case. Uh, oh, this is, a, this is a, an assault on our religious freedom. Well, uh, maybe. <laughs> uh, what that argument fails to acknowledge is that tax exemption is a form of public subsidy. That is to say that tax-exempt institutions, including schools, churches, other tax-exempt institutions, pay no taxes other than Social Security taxes, which means that the rest of the public, whether it's the neighbors in the neighborhood of a, a church or um, uh, the, the people in a town with a, a, a school, an a educational institution, they have to pony up extra to pay for public services, fire protection, police protection, parks, all the way up to national defense. So tax-exempt institutions are publicly subsidized. And Weirich, nevertheless, was able to kind of gloss over that fact and frame this as some sort of an assault on religious freedom, uh, thereby, as I say, writing a playbook, writing a page from the playbook that is being used these days by the religious right. Yeah, and I would definitely say still in in the um, religious right circles that religious freedom is, is that one, that one has kind of stood the test of time. And I completely tracked your argument on how that was kind of nice overlay over the segregational issue um, but religious freedom, it's it's almost as a, a posture of fear and panic that's that I've I've typically experienced in conversation about what the big bad government is going to do to you know sure. destroy our freedoms. Um, yes, in our own right. church context, I, I'm a pastor, but in our own church context, um, I oftentimes encourage the church with you know the realities of the kingdom of God is that <laughs> fear is not one of our <laughs> tactics. We, we don't right. have to fear what the government will or won't do. I mean, the kingdom of God is not going to be hindered in any way by right. some, you know, goodness, it, it thrived in the Roman empire for goodness sake. So um, I think it could do just fine in any culture that we throw at it. Um, well, I think, so and it, I think that's the way, of, uh, that's the way of faithfulness too. I, I think, um, you know, I have often said I'm a historian of religion in America, of course, as you as you know, and as, you, as you've said. Uh, but my sense is that religion always functions best from the margins of society and not in the councils of power. And once you begin yeah. to uh, lust after political power or influence or even cultural power, I think you begin to lose your prophetic voice. And that, to me, has been the overarching narrative of the religious right since its formation in the late 1970s. Yeah, that's right. Um, and so I, you know, just to, to, I guess, play the, the devil's advocate just for a sure. minute, you know, what, what would you say then somebody might say, okay, sure. The, the origins of the religious right were rooted in race. And I, and based upon the evidence you laid out, I, I would imagine that point might almost have to be conceded. Um, but then someone's like, well, don't, you know, don't get caught up in the genetic fallacy just because something began that way doesn't mean 
its present day expression is, you know, is foiled. You, you kind of wrapped up your book with, so what? Like, what, what, what does sure. all this mean? Like, why sure. is this important? Why do we need to be having this conversation? So how sure. would you, how would you respond to that? Sure. By the way, I love the the phrase uh, genetic fallacy. I I like that. I may use that. <laughs> that's all right. Oh, yeah. that's, that's a good that's a good way to put it. No, I, I, I the the analogy I use in the book is that you can build a beautiful building. You can have all sorts of architectural niceties and uh, baubles and uh, you know gargoyles, whatever you think is a, a beautiful architectural structure. But if that structure is built on a rotten foundation on rotten timbers. I think this entire structure uh, is compromised. And I think that's the case with the religious right. Uh, and yes, there's no question that uh, the religious right, at least ostensibly, has moved beyond racism uh, with the embrace of the anti abortion cause, for example. But I have to say that uh, the 2016 election for me, uh, raise that specter again. And it forced me to look again at this movement. Um, of course, the magic number that everybody keeps quoting, uh, which is still uh, stunning to me, 81% of white evangelicals, and the modifier white is important here, supported Donald Trump in, 19, in 2016, and most of them again in 2020. Now, this is a movement that claims to be about family values. I'm sorry, you just can't make that argument mm -hmm. and, and right. support Donald Trump as your nominee. You, you, you just, nobody's yet persuaded me of the logic behind that. But uh, I think as I began to look at it a little bit more clearly, it also made the 1980 presidential election made a lot more sense to me. Now, um, as you know, I, I, one of my books is a biography of Jimmy Carter. And even at the time, and I lived through these years, I was trying to figure out, I was scratching my head, why would evangelicals uh, abandon one of their own, Jimmy Carter, a born-again Christian, Southern Baptist Sunday school teacher for Ronald Reagan in 1980? Now, I acknowledge that um, Carter's presidency did not go all that well, and it was a very difficult time to be president. Um, I say in, the, in my biography, Jimmy Carter was dealt a bad hand as president, giving him inflation and the taking of the hostages in Iran and all sorts of things. And it's a hand that in some ways he played badly. Nevertheless, uh, why would evangelicals abandon one of their own for Ronald Reagan, who after all was a divorced and remarried former Hollywood actor, Hollywood not, known, not being known to evangelicals as a kind of bastion of piety. And... Uh, as I was writing Bad Faith, it, it began to come together for me, I have to say, in, in, a, in a new way. That is, the 81% for Trump in, in 2016, and also the abandonment of Carter for Reagan in 1980. And as I look more into Reagan, uh, Reagan began to resemble Donald Trump more and more and more. Uh, Ronald Reagan got into politics in California to oppose the Rumford Fair Housing Act, which sought to guarantee equal access to housing, both rental and purchase of housing. He was an outspoken opponent of both the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Throughout his political campaigns, he frequently used the racially charged term law and order. And um, those of us who remember his political career uh, also remember his vile caricature of so-called welfare queens. These are women of color who supposedly live off the public dole in lives of luxury. He was never able to produce, produce one of these welfare queens, but he was sure that they existed. And for me, uh, the, uh, the clincher was that Ronald Reagan opened his general election campaign for the presidency on August 3rd, 1980, in, of all places, and I still can't quite believe it, but he did, at the Neshoba, Neshoba County Fair in Philadelphia, Mississippi. And this was where 16 cent, summers earlier, members of the Ku Klux Klan in collusion with the local sheriff's department 
abducted, tortured, and murdered three civil rights workers during Freedom Summer 1964. And Reagan, of course, was the master of symbolism. I will never, I can't take that away from him. But lest anyone miss his meaning on that occasion at the Neshoba County Fair in Philadelphia, Mississippi, his speech evoked the old segregationist rallying cry, I believe in states' rights. So as I was writing Bad Faith, it became clear to me that the link between the origins of the religious right in defense of racial segregation and Donald Trump in 2016 and again in 2020 was uh, Ronald Reagan. Now, I know a lot of evangelicals regard Reagan as a kind of political messiah, but I think um, due diligence uh, in trying to account for history dictates that we look more closely at uh, who this person was and how he governed as uh, as president, certainly, with the uh, his economic policies, as well as his decimation, for example, of the Civil Rights Commission. And I think we get a little bit different picture from that of the glorification of Ronald Reagan that the religious right so frequently engages in. Yeah, and I appreciate it in your book, you pointing out some of these other issues is that sometimes when one or maybe two issues I mean, where a politician stands on those one or two issues, the, the rest of his policies kind of fade into the background. And we may not even do that due diligence to look at, you know, a holistic approach. Hey, if he's pro-life, well, as, as we've narrowly defined it, well, then it doesn't matter what else we have. We, you know, and, and, and I've heard the term too, that you used in your book, the single issue voters um, regarding kind of the way that abortion um, has been, has been framed as sort of maybe publicized or that's the banner um, under which yes. everything else is run. But, but could you talk a little bit about that tension that's created maybe in, in years past the, the issues surrounding this topic, but, but also kind of today, what do we do with this climate where we now have thousands of single issue voters who don't seem to recognize some of the, some of the other things at work in these political discussions? Yeah, I think it's a very good point, uh, Joshua. There, there's a whole lot of that uh, going around. And uh, I, I think, you know, I would even be prepared to say that uh, maybe a majority of voters in America are single issue voters on one issue or another. It may not be the abortion issue, maybe something else, but a lot of people become single issue voters. And I think that's, I think that's, um, uh, first of all, I think that's intellectually, intellectually lazy, <laughs> but also I think that, um, we need to be, uh, as, as, as the New Testament says, wise as serpents and innocent as doves. That is to say, we have to uh, kind of work through these matters in, in, a more, in, in a careful way, one that understands both the cultural circumstances as well as, I would argue as a historian, <laughs> the history. I think the history is awfully important uh, in coming to our political positions. And uh, that takes time. It takes... Uh, it takes a kind of judicial uh, temperament to do that, but we have to recognize that uh, things probably aren't as simple as they seem. And the abortion issue, again, I acknowledge that a lot of people are, are very much um, uh, concerned about that issue and kind of rubbed up over that issue. Um, but I think I, 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 my, my position on, for a long time has been that this is really a moral issue and it's not a legal issue. Uh, that is to say, uh, another way of saying this is that I have no interest in making abortion illegal. I would like to make it unthinkable. That is to say, to change the moral climate around that issue. And I would be even willing to support uh, public education, public service campaigns toward that end. Uh, encouraging alternatives other than abortion. But I don't think it's a legal issue. The only thing that both sides of the abortion debate agree on is that making abortion illegal is not going to significantly, at least, diminish the incidence of abortion. And I think we also have to recognize that uh, abortion rates are tied to economic circumstances. And 
people who have studied this matter say with great deal of confidence, I haven't, you know, I, I don't do the polling myself, but uh, the lowest abortion rates since Roe v. Wade have been during the administrations of Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. Why? Mm -hmm. The general uh, understanding, the general consensus is that it was because of economic circumstances that had the effect of lowering the incidence of abortion. So if the anti-abortion cohort is truly interested in limiting the incidence of abortion, I think you have to look at economics. We also have to look at issues of uh, sex education, contraception. I think that's, that's fundamental. Uh, and I think we really have to ask ourselves, are, are, are we willing to approach the abortion issue truly from the standpoint of limiting the incidence of abortion, which I would support wholeheartedly, or are we going to use the abortion issue as a political cudgel against our perceived political enemies? And that, I think, is uh, something that uh, that people need to reckon with. Yeah, that's right. No, they really do. And I, and I think, you know, it's really interesting, your connections between Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump. And I, of course, was just a baby when Reagan um, first was, was elected. And so that's, you know, I, I'll have to read that as history. But I have experienced the Trump era and the confounding nature of this. Yeah, right. When you talk about family values, or you talk about moral stances, but certainly, um, I think it was one of, one of President Trump's first speeches or on his, one of his campaign trails at Dort College um, in California, I think, where he stood up and talked about, you know, if you elect me, Christianity will have power again. And, and I, I think it, it's very scary to me, both as a Christian, as an American, as a pastor, to just recognize how much the desire for power and control and we want to do what we want is really embedded in so many um, policies and so many, um, it, it sound, that sounds bad to say. So then you, you know, you, you put some different language to it and make it sound better. Um, but sure. this discussion, as your book has so well laid out, is so much more nuanced um, than I think it's oftentimes yeah. talked about. Well, and what did Jesus say? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. And uh, mm. I think, you know, we have to, <laughs> we, we need to consider that in our, our political calculations, which is not to say we should abandon uh, the political arena. Um, and I have no interest in, in doing that. Uh, people um, mistakenly think that believers should not represent their beliefs or uh, uh, articulate their beliefs in the arena of public discourse. I don't think that's the case at all. I think it's important to do so. I think public discourse would be impoverished without voices of faith. But at the same time, we have to recognize that uh, the, 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 uh, the protocols of democracy, which means that uh, not only do we articulate our views, but we listen to other views as well. <laughs> and there's not much listening going around on today in uh, today's politics, I'm afraid. No, I'm, I'm afraid you're right. Um, well, as, as we wrap up our time a little bit, I just always like to ask the authors that I speak with this one final question, but of in, in the church today, when you kind of look at the landscape of the American church, where do you see the need the most of what you've written? What, what is the one biggest takeaway you would want to encourage Christians who want to live faithfully um, based on what you've written? Well, I'm a historian in addition to being um, an ordained minister. Uh, so history is very important to me. And when I see the religious right, in, in my judgment, uh, perverting the gospel of Jesus Christ, I, I find that very troubling. And so what I've been trying to do with bad faith and also other things I've written over the last several decades, really, is to to call evangelicals back to their better selves, to pay attention to the words of Jesus. And Jesus has something to say about how we should behave in this world, right? That's, that's what Jesus and his teachings were all about. Uh, he talks about, for example, welcoming the stranger, uh, as does the Hebrew Bible, by the way. 
And, you know, I understand that issues of national sovereignty and borders are, are complicated, but I don't think we as believers can simply gloss over that teaching about welcoming the strangers when we talk about immigration policy, for example. Jesus talks about caring for the least of these, and he even says that admission to the kingdom of heaven will depend, to some degree at least, on how well we obey what Jesus has told us, particularly in Matthew 25. So I would love to see evangelicals uh, reconnect with, uh, with the scripture, particularly with the, word, with the uh, New Testament and the words of Jesus. But also, and as I, I, I tried to suggest in that book, and as you said, it's a very small, a short book, and I meant it to be a short book. It's a quick read. What I try to do in the initial chapters of that book is say, look, evangelical political activism has not always been what we see today in the religious right. And in fact, if you go back into the 19th century, after the Second Great Awakening, evangelicals were very concerned about the contours of society. They were very concerned about trying to reform society according to the norms of godliness. And almost invariably, their activism was directed toward those on the margins of society. So they were involved in prison reform, for example. <laughs> they were involved in various peace crusades. They were involved in trying to abolish slavery. Now, some Southern evangelicals, I won't deny it, defended slavery, and I'm not trying to gloss over that. But particularly in the North, evangelicals opposed the scourge of slavery. They were very much involved in the formation of common schools, what we, we would call public schools or public education today, because they recognized that education was important for lifting the prospects of those on the lower rungs of society. Evangelicals were also committed to women's equality, including voting rights, which in the 19th century was a radical, radical notion. So I would love to see evangelicals reconnect with the words of Jesus, with the example of Jesus, as well as their own, I think, rather noble history of political engagement going back to the 19th century and extending, by the way, well into the 20th century uh, with uh, supporting the rights of workers to organize, for example. Um, and if you look at the overall agenda of evangelical political activism in earlier times in American history, and you charted that along a contemporary political spectrum, there's no question in my mind that that agenda for earlier evangelicals would list rather hard, frankly, to the left of the contemporary political spectrum. Now, that's not to say that all evangelicals need, need to vote to vote uh, um, along liberal lines, uh, although I wouldn't be disappointed if they did, frankly. But uh, let's consider that. Let's look at the example of our forebears. Let's look ex at what Jesus is saying in the New Testament, um, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, to take another example. Um, but Matthew 25, I think, is awfully important uh, for our political consideration. So that's what I've been trying to do with this book, Bad Faith, as well as in some of the other writings, uh, trying to call evangelicals back to their better selves. No, that's an excellent word. Um, call us back to true followers of Jesus. And he, he topples a lot of our preconceived notions about what life is like for us and what he expects of us. Um, well, and and, um, and who, did, who did he associate with? He associated with those uh, who, who were marginal uh, rather than uh, the political bigwigs of his day or as the religious bigwigs of his day. That's for sure. That's for sure. Absolutely for sure. Well, thank you so much for taking some time out of your, your day to talk. This has been great. Um, I definitely recommend your book. I've read it twice now, and um, it was really great to just listen to you recount those same historical points from your book and from all your research. But thank you for this gift to the church. Um, I love it, too, that it's so small and someone can really tackle the whole thing in just a couple hours. So um, I'm glad you wrote it. Joshua, you're very kind. Thank you. I appreciate the conversation. Yeah. Well, I hope you have a fantastic week. I'll let you know soon when uh, this episode goes live, but um, thanks so much again for your time.
My pleasure. God bless. Right.